All right, welcome to episode 12 of the Potty C. Uh, this week we've got a very special episode because it's Max's birthday. Wow, happy birthday, yeah, Max. Wait, what the hell? I didn't know that. Yo, happy birthday. That's right. Oh. You should know. I tweeted a little Pepe frog earlier. Oh, that's yo. true. Yeah. 93 gang, right? Let's go. Mm hmm. True. Oh yeah, we are we are the same oh. area. Oh, 94 gang, I'm afraid. Unlucky. Yeah, I'm, uh, oh, wow, what I'm a young old, one. I'm the old 31 now. Oh. Which is uh, which is rough. Oof, that's We're going rough. up there. Am I the oldest person here right now? Or is Dorky, did you already No, you're uh you're two months ahead of me. How good oh my god. Okay. We I'm have a older. cluster of birthdays because I'm three months from now, so are you ninety three gang? No, ninety four, so but oh, it's still young. like just in the calendar year, there's three months where all of our birthdays are. Wait, so you're are. not 30 yet? No, I'm in my 20s. I'm, I'm youthful. Oh my god. Wow. Yeah, you are youth. You are full of youth. Oh, you're, yeah. you're going to have a rough one, man. <laughs> yeah, as soon as you hit Your 30, back's going to start hurting real bad. Yeah. Like, Teeth going to fall ends. out. Yeah. It's really not exaggerated by anyone at all, either. It's like you hit 30, and then it's it actually is noticeably worse, yeah. Oh, um, no. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, we had a... Had a really fun weekend with the MDI. We had a we had a replacement cat last episode because of the practice for this tournament. We had Dorky competed, and then it ended up yesterday. So we do have our our, our regular cat back. Uh, what was your experience like playing this weekend? Hey, I'm back. It was exhausting. This, Wait, like the, I, I don't playing or the practicing or everything. Uh, both. I, honestly, everything. <laughs> Literally everything. And my team. My team is very exhausting, too. Man, having to deal with the same four people. God <laughs> damn, that is exhausting. But now I know why everyone always quits after MDI prison. And, you know, they all hate each other. And life Wait, goes what? on. Wait, what? Who do you hate you the most from it? your team? Yeah. But, oh, yeah, you guys are right, though. I don't even have to say it. Wait, I'm, I'm trying to think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. For, for, our, for our listeners who are not as tapped into the like high level sphere of gameplay. What is what is competing in the MDI mean for like time commitment? What does your last like couple weeks look like? So for me personally, I was waking up anywhere between seven and nine AM, which is like super early for D Gen gamers like me. But we would usually start around like eleven. Earliest was ten when it was like close to cups. And like early on, well, before the cups, it was around 1 p.m. And we would play all the way until 11 to 1 a.m., depending on how early we start. So like anywhere between 12 to 13, 14 hours. Mm. But after every that, day, I right? usually, yeah, pretty much every day during cups. And after that, I would just like spend... The remaining two three hours just like chilling a little bit just like watching what vods writing down notes for tomorrow i mean we've got like a lot of stuff in all our channels we have like an entire discord with like that's pretty much like how a lot of raid discords would look we have like mm -hmm. each boss and you have like a plan for every single one of them and a lot of discussion well, that's really cool but yeah it's it's a pretty large time commitment super exhausting but it was yeah, a lot a of lot fun of a lot of people that do it in our guild like refer it to MDI jail, right? Because like you have a pretty good habit of like you watch a ton of streams, uh, and you also stream a lot, and then it's like all of that stops, and you just wake up MDI, go to sleep MDI for. I mean, it's been like two, three weeks now almost, right? So, uh, you know, you come out of it at the other side, and you're like, man, I'm glad my cup is over, and I can't wait to take a week off before we prep for global finals. Dude, it's really be. weird. Yeah, today is like the first full day of like actually not doing MDI, and I feel like, what am I even doing right now? Like, <laughs> I've just been kind of been sitting around and just doing a little bit of streaming, doing a little bit of laying in bed, watching some YouTube. So you guys, you guys came in second. How did uh? Did you guys, what was your goal going into the weekend? Was that, was that like pretty much what you wanted to end up with? I, I know that had something to do with like some of the maps you practice and stuff. But like how, how do you guys feel like you did? The second is beyond our expectation. We were only going for qualifi qualifying. We only wanted to top four. Cause like, it's not like a loser mentality thing. Like I, I don't want to make it sound like we weren't trying to win. It was more of that. We didn't have that much time. We kind of just like. We just signed up to TR. We didn't have access until time trial started. Uh, people were learning their specs. You know, we were still learning the dungeons too because nobody was doing live keys. And 
we just didn't have time to prep for everything on top of the, the whole four dps that we saw in the tournament which we can talk about later having your healer learn how to dps too would be like too much of a task and on top of like us learning how to play around not having a healer so we didn't have as much prep as we wanted going into a tournament but because it was just cups our goal was to qualify like we weren't trying to do anything crazy we weren't trying to win per se but you know we were just trying to make sure we get top four which we figured would be kind of easy right like as long as we don't troll as long as, long as we don't screw up too much just yeah, there were, the really, there were five. There were five good teams, right? There was like what you the four that qualified and Dire Wolves, I think, was the other option yeah. where it was like you know that's a team that uh, could very plausibly top four, and then there were three teams that would mm -hmm. it would be much more like impressive, like a, a much more unlikely outcome for them to make it into the top four, right? So um, yeah, yeah. In fact, I would say Dogs in, was a huge surprise too. Yeah, I was about to like, say going in, that's what I felt like. There was like five teams in four spots. Mm -hmm. But then the, I guess, like, at least if you go by time trial rankings, like the fourth team dogs, the watermelon hat dogs, they, uh, they looked way better than their time trial ranking or, or maybe, I don't know. It's they, they do what like Dr. J teams kind of always do, right? Like they're Dr. J teams. They've been going back forever in the MDI. If you've been watching this and they're super interesting because they are, there's not many teams in the MDI. Really, there's more now than ever, but there's not many teams that could realistically take a game or win a match against Echo, for example. Like, in fact, in most seasons, it's relegated to, like, mandatory and, like, maybe perplexed, and, like, that's it. Used to be Method NA. But, like, they're a team that is, like, usually three or four ranks below the lowest ranked team that I just named, but they actually can do that. Like, it's a little inconsistent, but they usually have some really interesting routes. I also think sometimes that gets in their way. Like, I think sometimes they can get caught up in a lot of tech and kind of miss the main point of the run. Uh, but when it works, it works. And you saw them play Echo in the upper bracket. And I left the the weekend feeling like definitely the best four teams qualified. And previously, I thought Dogs was, like, going to really have to fight with Dire Wolves. But Dogs looked extremely good. I mean, they straight up beat Echo. Echo didn't, like, throw those games. They they were faster than Echo in the 2-1 that they beat them. So... It was uh, definitely super, super fun to watch. I think that was the most fun, just from a consumer point of view, that was the most fun MDI that I've watched since the grand, well, since the grand finals of the last one. Like, that was better than every MDI Cup last uh, time there was an MDI for me. Yeah, and that was just because it was a huge surprise. Yeah, it's like you said, uh, Dr. J. So I was actually talking with him earlier. We had a little radar interview, and he was there, and I was just, like, chatting with him. Mm -hmm. He... Said their, their team actually didn't practice a whole lot. They didn't have that much time because uh, apparently Velo was working a full-time job. So they couldn't really practice too much. And Shella was also a bit occupied. I don't know what happened exactly, but he couldn't play for a couple of days during uh, practice. So they actually were super impressive, all things considered. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he said something along the lines of like, he feels like, you know, this team kind of clicks with him because, like, normally it's just another Dr. J team, right? Like, it can, some it can sometimes be hard to have a team that meshes well together. Even if it's, like, a bunch of great players, it might not work out just because of, like, different mindsets or mentality when you're approaching problem solving or, like, how you want to be doing all the cooking or shot calling. Mm -hmm. that's like a big thing to always consider when it comes to these MDI teams like if you ever try to just like put together an all-star team it's really not gonna work you can have like the best players in the world and like if they just don't really mesh it doesn't work out but it seems like this time around they've put together a team that like they've so they've played last MDI together I believe whether it's MDI or TGP one of uh, them TGP I think it was yeah. I think this roster did TGP together. Yeah. So and, and and like you mentioned, I think for Dr. J teams, which I guess we're referring to them as Dr. J teams, like like they they don't usually last longer than one thing, right? Like they usually are making a swap every time. And I, I just really appreciate their shout out to the watermelon hat dogs, but I really appreciate their spot in the MDI. I think it's super fun. They're a super fun team to have involved because they can just, you know. The two options you're going to get with that team are they're going to try something crazy and it's not going to work, which is super fun, or or they're going to try something crazy and it is going to work, and they can beat teams that would conventionally you would think would be better than them. 
And that's also just awesome, right? So like you're you're never getting a bad viewing experience that team. There's always like it adds a ton of entertainment. Yeah, they were very impressive. I did not expect them to be. I don't. I don't want to say I didn't expect them to be a competition because like, you know that's that's like B of as hell. But I, I didn't expect them to be one of the walls that we had to go through. Like I thought it'd just be like all right, you know, we got to make sure we're on top of our game and then make sure we like we play our best against legendary and echo and hope they somehow screw up. But mm -hmm. dogs was actually really impressive. Yeah, legendary was another like big powerful team right that's uh oh yeah you know Yo, cool. yeah speaking of legendary i was very shocked by how good they were i yeah i mean yeah. i talked with hopeful a little bit too afterwards and you know what after this cup i think legendary actually had the best maps like even better than echo which is very rare the only thing is they may have played a little bit too aggressively because I, I feel like the approach to this cup probably shouldn't have been the same approach you would have with global finals. Like the way I view cups mm. is just kind of like, you know, play sort of safe. Don't do anything too risky because you don't have a whole lot of time to prep for it. And, you know, just qualify and get good seating. Because like chances are if other teams are going to screw up somehow, right? Which we saw this cup, actually. This cup, a lot of the teams and a lot of the matches, the teams couldn't pull out what they were doing in practice or like what they were theoretically able to do. But yeah, you know, like in terms of like how their runs actually went, like I'm pretty sure Legendary had one of the best runs across most of the maps. Yeah, they had and some like I've unlucky internet too. issues, but then also it just kind of felt like <laughs> yeah, they I heard about that oh, too. Yeah. They just like had it's crazy because they they got two owed by Last Hope. And then they beat Dire Wolves down in the lower bracket, made it to the next day. And then they got 2 0 by Echo. But across those like seven maps, which they only won two of, they looked like better in maybe five of them. Like they looked like they should have won yeah. in, in many that yeah, they, they ended should up losing. Have won, even they even against yeah. you, like they, yeah. they, they, I, like I think no internet issues. That would have been an extremely close series by the end. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's kind of shit happens. You can't like say it didn't happen. But yeah, they, I just, I just think that was. And maybe this all comes back to to talking about how the format change of MDI has has really helped. Uh, where I think in season one we had twenty four teams qualify, three cups, and then a last chance qualifier. I actually think it is a negative. We've talked about this before uh, that there is no last chance qualifier, but you could easily see the quality difference in this cup compared to uh when there were three cups i mean just putting more of the good teams in each cup i think is quality over quantity it just is just straight up better so much more interesting and the thing that i liked the most was there's a little four healing stuff that was interesting but like the atal Dazar evolution i would call it throughout the weekend right it started out with like oh there's some four dps pulls and then Perpl or perplex sorry legendary came out with a like Ataldazar has been in the MDI like four times or something. Like this, this has been iterated on infinitely, right? And they have, for the first time ever, I believe, their first pull includes pulling that first pull onto Presis. It requires some setup, but it's super value. It, it's, it uh, saves a pull. It's not direct value. It's not like that singular pull is twice as fast as doing two pulls, right? But it's like at least 50% faster. And then, and then I've never even considered this, but pulling trash onto Volcal, right? With that, like, moving moving those packs. I was like, man, that's super cool. And then we go into the next day and we're like, all right, Echo's in a Taldazar. Everyone's going to yoink this strat and, like, this is the crazy strat. And then Echo comes up, basically does their previous route, but just with four DPS. Um, and they have a much faster run than even that. And then it's a question of, like, which one's better? Legendary and Echo play each other. Legendary had a few mistakes. And in practice... I don't know what Echo's, like, best run was, but, like, in practice, uh, Legendary had, like, a 9-11, 9-12, something like that, uh, which would have won against Echo just barely, but, like, maybe Echo could have a better run, right? But, like, both of them super competitive, one with a healer, one with 4 DPS. In my opinion, that is exactly what the decision to remove a healer should be, which is, like, you're adding difficulty, but, like, can potentially get something else out of it, but also there was multiple runs this weekend where... Echo, Echo played four DPS in fall and got out DPSed in a, ver in a run where neither team wiped by a team with a healer. That was crazy. That's insane. Like, I mean, Restor Druid's super OP and Mark of the Wild is insanely good, but like, 
that's insane that that ha- like you, you, they just saying that it doesn't sound real uh so so i just think in general there was just so much interest less interest on the last day you know like if someone going into the last day was like hey echo echo's just gonna win seven games in a row and and that's the end of the tournament you know like it's like the first the second day was super interesting this day not as much that's what ended up happening echo's really really good uh but I just, uh, I don't know. The, the whole weekend to me was super, super fun. And I love to see like the mixture of 40 PS and healers and like seeing how those groups uh, ran up against each other. Yeah, the new format as well. Saturday was not only, not only did we have all the upsets on Saturday, but every single series on Saturday either qualified somebody to the global finals, eliminated somebody from the tournament or both, right? Which is like, oh yeah. I mean, to some extent, you're kind of stealing some excitement from Sunday with the new format by doing that. But uh, I think it worked out really well. Like, I think, you know, Saturday is the mm. longest day. It's the day where the most people are like around to watch and uh, putting the most tournament relevant stuff into the Saturday, I think, worked out really well. Because Sunday is kind of even if you're not actually playing for all that much, you're just playing for seeding and money, which, you know, most of the money's in the global finals. The seeding may or may not matter too much, but. You're still just getting games between the best teams on Sunday, so that's inherently interesting, right? And then Saturday is like all these games really matter for um for place or for you know qualifying and stuff. So I, mm, I think yeah. it was a success as well. I would also still like to see Last Stand return, like three teams per group, and then same sixteen top sixteen make it through, and then just do a Last Stand with two slots or something. Uh, and that way you'd then also add you know one team on Sunday not qualifying making it also a more of a relevant day. But... Interesting on Sunday, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Sunday did kind of feel like that because so much of the money is backloaded. I mm-hmm. mean, seeding has to matter a little bit. Like, think about it from Dorky's perspective. They really, really wanted top two. And then when you watched Last Hope in the finals, they they looked <laughs> like that they hadn't practiced a few of the maps as much as they did, which is true. And if you look at the rest of their map pool, they would have kind of been... A, if they really cared about getting the two seed, right... Um, it would not have made a lot of sense for them to spend a lot of time in Everbloom, and I forget the other, I think it was the Starter Dungeon, whichever one that was. It's Everbloom, it was Everbloom Rise, and, uh, Blackrook were the three that you actually played, and yeah, you banned Atal because, it, which was one you're, of the first few otherwise, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're gonna auto-lose that to Echo, that they've been playing, they played it like three times that weekend, and not only were they <laughs> super fast, but there was a 0% chance they were wiping, it was insanely clean. So, like, you know, you know you're auto-losing Atal, so I guess when you ban that out and hope for rise even if you haven't you felt better about your atoll than rise maybe there's something weird that happens with the tech they were trying to do you know like there's some hope there but yeah you like know, the boss resets or something yeah you could have i feel like you guys may have been able to win a best of three against echo or been very competitive with just the back three maps in the pool but basically because of your practice schedule and what you had to be good at to get to the second seed it involved you ignoring the first what you were going to be playing twice. So like you're going to have to beat Echo in the grand finals. Cool. But also you're starting down 2-0. You know, that's, you know, historically that's not going to work out too well. Right. Uh, yeah. If we got it, we, we reverse sweep. That would have been sick. That's what, kind of what we were banking on. Because like I think I thought we had a solid chance in multiple dungeons like Black Rook, Darkheart Faked, Frown, Waycrest. We, those well, those were the four dungeons we practiced the most, and those were the four dungeons we would have loved to face them. We might not have won, but at least we would have had at least a very solid match against them. Yeah, word the on rest the of the dungeons were. Yeah, word on the street was your throne was sick, and there was a seven dungeon pool, and throne was the only one not in it, so that's pretty unfortunate. <laughs> um, and then I think the seating you mentioned, like why Sunday matters, because Sunday was definitely a little bit uh, more anticlimactic. I think compared to Saturday and I think a lot of the reasons you brought up are why I think seeding matters for sure. Like if you are the two seed, for example, let's say you really want to get the two seed. There was a, the, the, this, uh, last hope legendary and dogs, all of those teams, I would have, I, I think any of those teams could have, could win a match against the other one. Uh, really, they, they all look really solid, but if you're the two seed, let's say, let's look at next week, perplexed and mandatory. Maybe we can, uh, kind of segue into talking about next week, but, Mandatory and perplexed. There's a lot of really good teams in that tournament. Mandatory and perplexed are really good. I would bet a lot of money that whoever ends up number one and two, I bet that in either order it is mandatory and perplexed. So that means in the first round of the global finals, if you're the two seed, you dodge those two teams specifically. Where if you're the three and four seed of this tournament, you are basically guaranteed to round one against either one of them. Not to say they couldn't win, but it's going to maybe be harder than whoever the three and four seed ends up being next week, right? So. Uh, I, th- I think the seeding, at least getting the two seed, I think the two seed is way more valuable than the three seed 
And I think that's not that's a much bigger difference between one and two as far as like the ease of the bracket in the grand finals might potentially be. Yeah, so my mindset when it comes to global final seedings, I generally don't worry about it as much because like ultimately when we're going into global finals, we're going for the win, right? Like we care about winning. So it definitely helps facing the lower seed teams early on. That way we can like have more chances. But ultimately, we got to beat all the teams. We got to be able to beat all the teams. So that part doesn't matter as much for us. Hmm. Whether we're okay. facing mandatory or perplex or echo, like I feel that. I mean, that's also the mentality you have point. to have. Right. But I also feel like having to beat mandatory or echo twice versus once could be the difference in you ending up in the grand yep. finals at all versus not. Yeah, right. Sure. Like I, I think it definitely matters a little bit. But uh, yeah, I feel that. I, I think. I wonder if next week we'll live up to the first week the first week of every mdi season has a little bit extra going into it because you get to see a pretty good idea of what these dungeons are gonna look like like i don't know i'm just gonna make up a number like 70 to 80 percent of the thinking and the cool stuff that you're gonna see in those dungeons you're gonna see some form of that in the first week and the second week the runs start looking a lot more of the same, right? Like the Ataldas are thing. Yeah, 100%. The Ataldas are thing is not going to happen next week. There's going to be some over that week, everyone's going to kind of come to the conclusion of like which one of these is the best and most consistent thing to do. Uh, that being said, I think the teams that are playing next week, there's more close competition next week on paper, I think, than there was this week. And specifically, who you expect, like, let's be real. I think everyone expected Echo to come out number one in this cup, right? I genuinely could not tell you either way whether I thought Perplex or Mandatory was going to win next weekend, right? Or, or, or another team. You know, I, I, don't, I think it's a bit more wide open, and I think that makes Sunday specifically a lot more interesting. Yeah. yeah. Usually what happens is... So this is actually my first time playing the first cup. Normally I'm playing in one of the later cups. Being in the first cup is so different from being in any of the other cups. Because that's just when, like, you don't know what to expect. Like, you don't know what type of times people are putting up. In fact, like, even Echo didn't know what types of times people were putting up. They probably thought their fall was extremely quick, and then all of a sudden, dogs were beating them without mm -hmm. before DPS. And they probably thought playing Rogue in Black Rogue Code was, like, fast, and they were just, like, Going really quickly, but then they saw all these teams and with the swapped. Shadow Priest instead. Yeah. And they just like ended up copying the strategy. Because like I don't know if you guys noticed, but their strategy in the beginning was all right, drag all the mobs in and then keep them in a CC, right? They do like yeah, a double blind. fear into yeah, mass blind, and then kill them off afterwards. Which seemed really good because like you gotta kill the boss and you gotta open the door, but then you have all that RP time to finish the trash. But teams were just going so much quicker by getting a slower boss, but they were whittling down the trash and by the time the door opened all the trash was dead so teams were like actually leaving much earlier and so i think the second cup can really see all the innovation from the first cup and just not necessarily copy but like at least have an idea of what to expect and i was actually talking with uh yips this morning they've started practice for their cup which is next week mm -hmm. and he's like man it feels like it's so hard to innovate on some of these keys. It's kind of annoying. Like, like what else could they really do? Sure, there's like probably some tech or like some differences with affixes and all, but there's really not a whole lot they can do differently now that we've seen it all in the first cup. So I feel like the first cup is more about how well you can learn and, you know, like pick up these dungeons and do all these, figure out tech. Whereas the second cup is more like how quickly can you adapt to what people have already done? Yeah, this season in particular, so many of the dungeons, it's like converging to a maximalist way of pulling the dungeon where you're just like, what is the absolute most we could pull in this section, right? Like first pull a black or cold, you can't go bigger than all the trash onto the boss all at the same time, right? Like there's not yeah, just held back by RP unit, right? Like what, what are you going to do this more? I mean, I guess you could pull some trash from the other side or something as well, but like, yeah. there's not a, there's really not a realistic way. It's not like the, there are some dungeons and some previous expansions where it's like, okay, this is a 10 pull dungeon. What if we do some Tetrising around of the pieces and stuff and we turn it into a nine pull dungeon, right? Like that's, 
that's something you can do in some dungeons. But this time around, it seems like a lot of them are basically just like, <laughs> yep, there is the boss and all the trash you can pull onto it. And then there's the next boss and all the trash you can pull onto it, right? And like, we have we have reduced the dungeons down to so few pulls that it's pretty hard to look at the best strategy from any given dungeon in group A and think of a faster way to do, or like even think about how it would be possible to do it faster. Now, I'm sure they will come up with some stuff, like there's always innovation, but it feels like this mm. time around, it's going to be particularly hard to find uh, anything big there. I think some of the dungeons have room there, like Throne. I don't think we saw a good Throne this weekend. So when you look at... Throne was Echo's permaban as well. That uh, I think they were originally planning to permaban Rise, but once they got sent to the lower bracket, they were going to have to play it. And then they, they've they been banning Throne as a prio instead. So there certainly might be... Because I think they were trying to hide their Rise strat. I mean, they said, like, it's a shame we had to show this. Um Throne might also mm. have some tech from them. Obviously, you know, Last Hope, you guys are confident that you, that was a good dungeon for you, but Echo permabanning a dungeon, right? That doesn't mean that it's a bad dungeon for them necessarily. It might be their best dungeon or one of their best, second best. Correct, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not I'm not too worried about the Rise thing. I think with the time trial dungeons, it's obvious to me at least that Perplexed definitely figured out the same thing, right? Like they had, I think they had six or eight seconds behind Echo. It is impossible to get that close to a time without doing that. I think looking at the times of every other team that it's possible that uh, no other team figured that out. So you probably would have seen it this weekend any, anyway, unless Perplexed also banned it out. Uh, but Throne has a lot of... So an MD, when you're preparing for the MDI, you want to kind of start at the beginning of the dungeon of like, okay, so every single pull, remove, forget what you do on live. You want to make sure that you're always doing something, number one, with a big prio target that matters, and you want to be progressing the dungeon. What progressing the dungeon mean is like sometimes your pull needs to end with some pack that spawns another pack, like in Black Rook Hold. Or uh, you need to be making sure that you're like at least doing the pull like 50 yards further in the dungeon, very similar to how Dorky's team uh, and Legendary do the first pull of Darkheart Thicket versus a few of the other teams, which did the exact same mob count, but were doing it way closer to the beginning of the dungeon, right? Like that's the way you're moving through the dungeon in an efficient manner. Throne didn't really have that, right? You saw people do the pull at the beginning onto the big Ravager. You need to be hitting a Ravager in every pull, right? Like, they have too much health. Same thing with the second pull. You're pulling it onto the Ravager. Uh, third pull, they're going onto the boss. That's good. Then you do another boss. Okay, then after that, the, there is ways in mob count to, like, immediately find yourself onto one of the, like, the third boss, for example, instead of doing that pull with all the, like, guys who suck you in and stuff. And then, like, finding a way to do all the rab uh, all of the Tempests on the other side. Like, I, I, there's definitely room to remove a pull and throne with some kind of intricate skipping that I'm really looking forward to either next week or for the Grand Finals. But you guys mentioned Black or Cold. I hated watching Black or Cold this weekend. That, that dungeon, to me, is the Shadow Moon Burial Grounds of this MDI, where it just ends up in map pools and people don't ban it, but it's just the worst thing to watch. There's no innovation. Ataldazar, man, Ataldazar this weekend had to be all-time great i think you know what altalazar might be the all-time best mdi dungeon specifically it's just it's always something new and cool and maybe something to learn from that is you know maybe maybe every every time you're making dungeons give us a few more non-linear like you can kind of go in different places and do different things that's that's i know in mdi that's obviously exactly what you want an open canvas to do whatever but even on live, man, there's always a ton of innovation in which direction you go uh, for these dungeons. I, I wish I wish they did more of that. Just like once a season, there's like two dungeons at least that are like fully like you can go in any direction. How do you, Dorky, how do you feel about that as a competitor? Like, do you do you, do you kind of feel that? Do you, do you find yourself where it's like you don't really enjoy the dungeons that are a little bit more straightforward? Uh, I think it really depends on what I'm playing. Like for MDI specifically... It definitely sucks a lot, just because, well, I mean, everyone's kind of doing the same thing, right? It's just a matter of execution and just who pulls faster or, like, who, who pulls more aggressively and, you know, which team does more damage or which team manages Sanguine better. So that part definitely sucks. And I've always been a big fan of being able to do something exciting. Like, in the first MDI I competed in back in Shadowlands, we came up with the triple shard pull in Halls of Atonement, and that was sick. That was sick to do, that was sick to watch. We were able to put up some crazy times because of it. But it doesn't really feel like there's a whole lot of that this season. 
And I think that's like a, I think the larger reason for that is not really just the dungeons, but how this season end, ended up with Vengeance having insane amounts of control. So you just have like every single trash pack being locked down by the Demon Hunter. You have the way dungeons are scaled this season. You know how we've talked in the past about how M plus right now is like, okay, everything feels like it hits way too hard. You're running into a survivability wall before you're running into a time wall. Mm -hmm. And you really feel that effect in MDI. It's so weird. Like these keys feel so high and low at the same time. And it's never really felt this way in MDI. The trash is like dying instantly. So you're having all these runs be 10 minutes or sub 10 minutes, which we haven't seen before. Like Ataldazar being a nine minute is crazy, right? And things just hurt real bad, even, even though they're low keys. We're doing like a 23k. It's like, why does, why does Okart's stomp do 80% of our health? So oh, it's, yeah, it's really hard to game. balance. Yeah, like, like, it's also part of why we're seeing this no healer meta going on. Because the keys are really low, so everything just dies instantly. Like, why would you even need a healer when, in, when everything's just kind of dying and you're much better off killing everything before they kill you? And also... Yeah. Yeah, I also like it. it I, f I feel like it kills a lot of the creativity in these dungeons because if we weren't just pulling every, all the dungeons in one pull, there'd probably be a little bit more creativity in terms of like, okay, like instead of doing it all in one pull, what if we have to play a little bit safer and just maybe do this pack onto boss and then this pack with another pack? Like, imagine if Black Roll Cold, you had to kind of think about how you piece together the mini bosses with the boss instead of just like, all right, just like run it all down, pull it all. Grip it all, sign sigils, and just blow it up, and then just move on to the next pack, and just do it all again. If there was like some way to like piece together the poles, because you I couldn't mean, handle that big of both, it'd be more exciting and more interesting. It's literally the same way we did Black or Cold back in Legion, because we had three Blood Elves, and now your Vengeance Demon Hunter is just doing the same thing as the um, as the Arcane Torrents used to do, right? And just do it on your on right. your class kit, yeah, yeah. It's tough. Like it's hard to think of a fix for it like okay imagine if they just deleted vengeance demon hunter for instance and you couldn't play that in these keys how much do you think that would hinder your ability to do this oh it would be so different i think some of these poses would be like insanely impossible like the first pull of black rook hold i don't even know if that'd be possible having four casters and those like three retainers or some shit with uh, soul blades it is way too much for your team to control also, you would probably maybe even see like different classes because like right now we're, we're seeing these specific specs because they're the ones that happen to do the most amount of prial while having like good AOE. Yeah, they're it's not the most amount of AOE. So yeah. good. Right, like we were expecting, you know, maybe Unholy DK would be played, but you just don't need that AOE. A lot, it, more, more often than not, you know how we talk about MDI being progressing the dungeon and killing things that actually matter. On Holy DK is like the opposite. On Holy DK, you bring it for the AOE, for the safety, for just like killing all the trash off before they kill you. But there's not a whole lot of that this season. Well, it's because the talent trees have changed what Unholy is. Like, like people look at Unholy back in the day as like, oh, it's this class that did a million damage. The reason that Unholy was good for MDI is because they were the class that was destroying bosses faster than everyone else because they used the trash to amplify their boss damage, which is exactly what the current comp does. Like, Shadow Priests are broken damage profile. Mages are broken damage profile, right? Yeah, it's uh, so OP. Yeah, and, like, so, like, that's... They're, they are unholy DKs in a way. Like, they're not using the trash to buff their boss. It's just that, like, they just do so much effortless cleave while also banging the boss, right? And, like, unholy DK with talent trees, they don't do that. It's like, if just you could, AOE. If you could get unholy DK with, like you know, a, you know, a more favorable talent tree setup and they're doing like Garg pulls on bosses with Fester, like massive Festermite stacks and they don't have to like make too many concessions between AOE and single target, they would be like they used to be, right? But like now they're just unfortunately one of the classes who have to make more of a decision to choose like which one you're doing and you're just always going to lose to classes that are able to do both at once and especially in MDI, be super single target focused because that's everything. Uh, and then also you're just like freely cleaving, right? It's 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 too specific now. Well, because there have been MDIs where the AOE has been more important, right? Like it used to be a Taldazar yeah, first pull on the left, yeah. 
you were on the clock, right? Like it was a difficult challenge oh, yeah. to kill all the mobs before they would overwhelm you before you ran out of your stuff. But with the state of just everybody's AOE being high enough already and Vengeance Demon Hunter controlling a pack for 40 years, right, before it actually gets to start doing stuff, that's just not the resource that you're light on in a dungeon this season. So why would you bring a, a spec that specializes mm, so in it true. like Unholy DK, right? Like in the Unholy DK times, in general, AOE in this game was much less balanced. Like, right. right, we've talked about this with balance in the game right now. If you remove you know, super utility, defensiveness, group buffs, whatever. Like, if you just look at the ability for a class to top overall in whatever level hierarchy you're doing, there's a ton. And that has never been that way. So your MDI pool is narrowed down even further. Of like, okay, well, everyone can do that, you know? So you're, you're looking for the classes that have synergy and have a lot, whatever, really good talent trees or really good prio. Well, that, that actually leads me to something. I wanted to ask... So, so we kind of went over the comp a little bit. We can maybe get into that more in a second. I, w I want to know your all's opinion on the key levels that we're seeing. And then also that's directly related to the four, the four DPS situation. So like, first of all, do you guys like four DPS existing? Um, is there a place for it? Is it because the keys are so low? Are, in general, in MDI, the keys being higher or versus like lower, like, like, you know, closer to like TGP levels, like, like what... What is the most interesting viewing experience for you? Starting with Dratnos, probably. Okay, yeah. So I don't know. On my side, like, I have a few different, you know, hats that I wear on this thing, right? Like, because obviously I'm involved with like casting and and uh, that side of things as well. So I personally, as a viewer, like, I love the no holds barred, medium to low key level things getting done. Like, I I feel like the even the twenty fours and stuff to in this cup we're on the higher end of where I think the pull sizing just gets so like you, you stop having a lot of options because of the volatility of some of the pulls, like the 24 Waycrest, for instance, I think it was good, but I wouldn't have wanted that to be higher. I don't think, I don't think I would have, I would have liked that not. to be yeah. higher than the 24, but on the flip side, I don't like four DPS being a dominating strategy. And you know, you can make an argument like it wasn't used in every dungeon. It lost and like echo lost with it just on damage to a, a three DPS comp. Um, but I think that was that was only like one dungeon. Aside from that, 40 DPS won in pretty much every map that it was played, and it looked better uh, mm -hmm. in most of them as well that it was played. And it was only like three or four of the dungeons. But um, I don't think that's good. I like I don't mind watching it, but I think it's good for MDI to be. Obviously, it's never going to be fully relatable to the live experience. TGP is much more relatable to people even if you're only pushing 20s or whatever tgp 27s look more realistic to you than mdi 20s because mdi 20s they're just doing yeah. much more than you can do right and uh you know the nature of infinite scaling a less good group kind of looks the same as a really good group on a much higher key um but even with that in mind i think that when the comp starts being something that like nobody is really doing on live that's bad and that's like no healer has that problem where it's just like you know, it's World of Warcraft esports, but then you tune into the Warcraft YouTube channel and they're just doing something that you don't do on live, right? Um, like starting from their comp and that, I think it's probably, like, I think it would be cool if no healer was a strat that you could bust out like two to 5% of the time yeah, as I like a tech choice, agree. right? Like, I feel like that would be the sort of thing where it's like, oh, you know, it's like in StarCraft, this guy's cannon rushing in the in, in StarCraft or whatever. And it's like, oh, wow, like they don't normally do that in pro play, but that's really that, you know, they're doing it. A little, I guess that that's a little bit different because people do that on the ladder all the time in that game. But uh, and nobody does no healer on on live. But I think, that, yeah, niche strat, it would be good. But I feel like with the current key level dilemma, like I don't even think you could raise the key level and kill no healer. Maybe you could, but I don't think you'd I think if you just bring the key level up to 25, 26, I don't know, now was saying this. Uh, at some point, which is like people would just do smaller pulls, but still play no healer because it's not like the no healer comp would struggle in surviving the bosses and stuff as the key goes up by a level or two, right? Um, and it's not like the healer group lets you pull much bigger at that key level than the no healer lets you do. So I don't, I, I think it might actually be one of those cases where, like, okay, maybe we just have to give up that two to five percent chance thing and fix the problem from being a possibility by just banning it and just being like, you gotta, well, you gotta oh, play yeah. healer. Well, the, 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 Dad, that's such a crappy solution, but I feel like. It, I mean, it's unfortunate. It, it was the rule in the past. So the history of this is 
it used to not be a rule, then it was a rule, then it was changed to not be a rule again. Oh, was it a rule? I actually didn't know that. Yeah, it, it was, was a rule for Legion, a while. Legion, yeah. it was like really, really prevalent. And then I don't know exactly when it was changed, but basically they they decided to do the solution he just talked about where they were like, well, we don't have to worry about it existing because we can just make it not exist. Uh, but I actually think in this season, it it's very dungeon dependent. Like you said, like if you're already no healing a dungeon, like and you get a map that's two key levels higher in the grand finals, you're going to start from a perspective of like, how can we four heal this? Not like, oh, we're going to do the same pulls, but three heal it, right? Um, I, I do agree. I think that like, when when people are four DPSing keys and it looks very easy, I think that's obviously a huge problem. Like, but I think it kind of goes back to what we talked about last week with the other cat. You weren't here, dorky, but we were, you know, Growl made a great point about the defensive ramp in this game like how strong classes have gotten defensively and then obviously the class trees added a lot of uh, off healing but really it's the defensive like classes are invulnerable you have so many tools to stay alive right and i think there's a lot of implications on that in the game but like you will always find a way to live at this level i think that four dpsing in the mdi should exist i think it's really exciting but it should feel like i'll use like a hockey metaphor i've been playing a lot of hockey recently dratnos looks like he's a hockey enforcer um at the moment <laughs> actually is, is the tooth still did you get the tooth fixed yet yeah so i they the like bottom half of the tooth that was still up there they extracted they put a screw in there now um mm -hmm. and i actually have like a temporary tooth thing but it gives me like a really noticeable lisp right now so i okay. i'm not wearing it, it but it. uh cool. I, i'm gonna try and like learn how to not have a lisp with it for a while but and then in a couple in like a month they're gonna screw in a new permanent tooth in there so once it's all okay, recovered cool. yeah cool. Well, I wanted to use the hockey analogy because I feel like, um, and actually I got this from a YouTube comment in one of our previous uh, videos, where it should feel like you're pulling your goalie. Mm. At the end of a game in hockey, if you're behind, you pull the goalie out of your net to get an extra skater to maybe, maybe they score on the empty net. It's super easy, right? But you have no other choice, right? You need to generate offense to potentially beat it. I would love for DPSing to be, okay, we have to try to beat this team. Our success rate of this dungeon just went down from... 90 percent to 60 or 40 but like we can shave a minute off of this by 40 psing and we practice for this exact reason i think that as a competitive standpoint and a viewing standpoint is fascinating um and something that should not be removed but how often where's the line there like how hard is it to find the line of like where 40 psing is barely like these teams are really good right how do you find the line of where it's barely possible but feasible and not consistent and it not being something you just know you have to do every run right like i would hate to see the grand finals be your 40 psing every key and it looks like there's no chance of them surviving if that's the case i don't know if the key level is too low or like you said if it's like not a solvable problem uh but it's definitely interesting like i mean i was on a co-stream with jb all weekend like i heard all of the takes about how he he's like hard stance anytime there's 40 ps it's bad but I think there's a world where it's good. Just like you said, I completely agree with you. I, how do you feel as a competitor, Dorky, on that? I mean, it's not just me. I think there's been a lot of opposition to for DPS. It's not just JB2. I, I've heard from the Echo guys. I've heard from uh, Dr. J, you know, various other competitors. Nobody really likes having this whole for DPS situation because I've mentioned before, it's too much of a learning process. Uh, there are just like too many variables. Your healer has to learn how to play DPS and know how to play healer. Your team has to learn how to play around not having a healer, which is like a massive learning curve by itself. And there's also understanding which DPS to even bring. Like as we've seen in the Everbloom, we saw Zelia bringing a Red Paladin that brings consistent insane damage across the board. And it does really good support with the off healing and sacks, etc. But augmentation ended up being better in that dungeon because they were able to one phase the last boss. Augmentation was just better for that boss, had, had better damage. It, it enabled dogs to one phase the last boss and it shaved easily 20 to 30 seconds. And yeah. I, I don't like this whole like having to play around four healers and just figuring it out. I think I find it much more interesting when you're playing around the dungeon rather than playing around your specs. But it's a hard problem to solve because as I've mentioned before, right now I think it's just, well, like classes have way too many defensives, right? As you guys have mentioned last week, I think that's a huge problem. There's also 
way too much off healing. Like V right now on Shadow Priest is absurd. Insane, yeah. But also, these dungeons, like, there's just, it's, the mobs die way too quick because the keys are extremely low. We're seeing 22s, 23s, 24s, which are, what is it, like, 8 to 10 key levels lower than the max currently on live. And that's kind of unheard of because normally MDI keys are, like, what, 5 to 8 key levels lower than the highest? But at the same yeah. time, like, if you bump up these key levels, it, it's just going to be out of control. You're not running into issues of killing the mobs in time. You're running into issues of the mobs just feeling like high key mobs where they just kind of just kill you in one or two hits. And that's not really the spirit of MDI. And it's like what Nal said too. Like if you're doing a higher key, then well, I mean, you'll still play four healers or four DPS because you'll be able to kill off mobs really quickly. You'll just do smaller pulls. You're just not going to be risking as much. And the bosses will still be manageable because it's still relatively low. And you're able to finish off all the bosses before anything bad happens like you have oh also warlock is a huge reason for this whole for dps because i don't know if you guys have noticed but the warlock pet dispel solves a lot of the no healer situations yeah. oftentimes in these dungeons you kind of need a healer not for the healing but for the magic dispel like if you look back at uh, shadowlands dungeons Say you're trying to do a cool for rock in Feeder of Pain. Well, I mean, you're kind of just going to die to the magic debuff because it's supposed to be a dispel mechanic. But because you have a warlock now and because you have dwarves and you have mass dispel, all these ways of dealing with magic debuffs, you don't necessarily need a healer. Not to mention that the three DPS you're bringing primarily, the fourth one's a little variable. They're all unkillable beasts, you know? Like, Shadow Priest is, like, a little bit more human, but, like, you have verse stacking Warlocks and Mages existing, right? Which are two of, like, the very, very tankiest classes in the game. So it just, it, it smooths that out. Not to mention Hellstones are extremely clutch, right? Uh, so, like, the, the comp kind of enables it, right? Like, for example, if you lose VE, if you lose that Mass Dispel, if you lose Warlock and it's a damage loss to bring those things, it's infinitely less likely that you're running 40 DPS, right? Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of see where you guys are coming from. I also, I was thinking about the key level thing too. Like in the MDI, like, I guess there's a way like having it be lower keys makes sense. Cause it's like, you're trying to, it is a different thing than TGP, right? Um, but also you need the ability to have people wipe, but also you don't want it to be like Legion, right? Where like, it's a wipe fiesta. It's like, you're only like basically a team wipes and you just know they lose. Like it, like, you know, some of the most interesting games to watch this weekend um, was Everblooms and Falls. And it didn't seem like anyone was going to wipe in an Everbloom or a Fall, but it ended up you watching a DPS race for 10 minutes, you know? And that's, you know, the, the, maybe those key levels were too low. There wasn't really a chance of wiping, but in a way, it like kind of made the whole thing interesting. Um, so I, I just, I want to know what you guys think about that, like specifically key level. Like, would you like to see significantly or noticeably higher keys? Do you think there's a room for 22s to be played in this tournament? Or do you think that it is just so low that it isn't interesting, right? Because like doing this on 15s would be, I mean, it would just be a, it just wouldn't be interesting, right? It's just things are actually too easy. Uh, what, what do you think? I... I think the levels are pretty good for this because I don't actually think you solve the problems by raising... Like, I think the there are textural problems with the, the way that current classes work and the way that the current dungeon pool interacts with those classes where it's like those maps are going to look like that. But I actually don't think you solve that by going up a couple levels. I think you just make them slower... Um, but I don't think you necessarily improve that side of things. So I think that just leaning into it this season and having it be like, look, this season the dungeons are 10 minutes. It's like no holds barred, guns blazing. It's a shorter season anyways. Like that's uh, that's what the dungeons are like this season. I think that makes sense. I don't know. I mean, like historically the level's often gone up by one or two going into the global finals anyway, and that could probably work out fine. But I wouldn't want to see us go up to like 27s or 28s or anything like that. Um Interesting. Do you think global finals, if you just shift up every key level plus two, do you think that's a better product? I I, I haven't thought it. too much about it. I think I would argue for like plus one only, but um, 
maybe plus two is fine. I don't know. I mean, maybe plus zero is even fine as well. I, I'm not sure. I, I just, I, I know there's a lot of people that are like, look, these keys are just not scary at all unless we go plus five on them. And I don't think that, I just don't, that I don't think be, MBI on high keys is good. Um, that would be extremely uninteresting, I think. Yeah. Like TGP is great, but I think that it needs that different format. I don't think it works well in the one run against one run uh, format. So I don't know. I Yeah, I like I... I think the key level is not really the problem, though. Like, I think that the issues that people are having about the keys being easy leading to these other problems, I don't think it's a key level thing. Like, I don't think it... Because I think, you know, if, if the MDI was run on 15s, we would have that problem and the key level would be the reason. But here, I don't think that's true. I don't, I don't think you fix these problems by bringing the keys up unless you bring them up way too high. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's like what I've said. You know, I think it's just a combination of the dungeons, the scaling, and how classes work right now, really. It's, it's a combination of all of that. But my biggest worry is, like I've said, are, are we really going to see any innovation going into Cup B or like Global Finals? I fear that it could just be not as interesting to watch if it becomes... This whole, like, we're just seeing sort of the same things being done from the first two cups going into global finals. Yeah, And I, I'm not exactly sure if going higher key level would solve that either. Yeah, maybe okay. plus one and a half levels or something. I don't know. Max, do you have a... <laughs> plus one and a half. A I, mean, I, I, don't know. I don't know if I have a take other than when the keys have been lower... I think a forget about the, like the chance of wiping or whatever, but I don't. I just love watching a key where you, uh, the at least a couple times this see or this weekend where it just looked like two teams were like, oh, you're like, oh, they did a little bit better DPS that pull. Oh, their sanguine management was a little bit better there. They're not wiping as much, and it's just about you know, it's like what you talked about with like higher keys. Like right now, it doesn't scale well on like timing the key as it does. You know, it scales higher, obviously, your incoming damage, like how deadly the key is, right? And you want more about timing keys to be like, can we make it in time? The MDI right now is like purely speed, at least in those lower keys, it's like speed against speed. And I can't speak from a competitor standpoint. I haven't played in this MDI. I haven't played an MDI in like two or three years. But as a viewer, those matches are super interesting. You Even if you know from the beginning that no one's going to wipe, maybe you'll have a death, whatever. It's still just fascinating to see like people pass each other over and over again on bosses. So I don't think that the viewing experience for lower keys in the MDI, at least as low as there are now, there's certainly a world where you go too low and it's certainly not good. Uh, but I, I think the 22s and 23s were fun to watch. I think the 24s, I think 24s fine too. I actually, I actually think the key levels this weekend were really good. Like I think the 24s are fine too. I think if you were to shoot it up a little bit, if you did that same Waycrest Manor on 26, I think it would have been a lot less interesting. Right, like I think like 24 maybe was the level where like you still you guys had a really really clean run. You saw, uh, you saw Dr. J's team, the watermelon hat dogs. You saw them change their routing because they wanted to have lust on raw. Totally makes sense. Like, like a lust on raw should be better than a lust on witches. There's no time where the witches are like going immune and stuff like that. It's just like a big super healthy boss. Like that makes sense. Like I I love seeing stuff like that. I think you're way less likely to see. Things like that on a way higher difficulty. So I think the difficulty is fine, but um, all right, I think I think we've cooked on MDI a bit. Uh, I I saw Franck posted this before we talked today about are there other like potential WoW esport evolutions? We we we've seen this uh, we've seen MDI play out for years now. They added the TGP. A lot of people prefer the TGP. Great great uh, thing. Last chance qualifier MDI kind of similar thing. Really really good uh, system that they have going. Is there any other, and AWC, obviously, I always love watching AWC. And speaking of that, before we even move on, I think the viewership this weekend was really strong. Like, across the main channel and co-streaming, oh, yeah, there was, was a ton of viewers, yeah. So obviously people enjoy this. Uh, but, like, if there's any other evolution of WoW Esports, what, what, does, that, what does that look like? Or, or, or could that exist? What, what, would, what would be your idea? Are we thinking just in the M plus space or, like, outside of that as well? It could be anywhere. I don't know if it would be as exciting outside of M+. I mean, I'm sure these, there could be ideas of, like, dragon riding or whatever race. I personally would like something like 
what was the thing you did, Drannel? So like the, the push week. Oh, the push week or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought that was so what is cool. That, that what was is that? that was uh, was it was displayed. like one time during BFA for a week. Me and Tettles, um, we like got a permission from a bunch of people pushing keys to restream them, and we just spent like the whole week watching teams pushing keys. And yeah, it was uh, one of the biggest push weeks. Oh, yeah, it was. It was like a. It was really sick. It was a. Uh, it, it was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, so many teams were playing too. That was so sick. I, I thought I thought I had an idea like that would be cool if you just like incentivize an entire week of the best teams in the world trying to get the highest keys done. Yeah, it'd be like of some TGP sort of like on a bigger scale and without the tournamentiness to it. Just yeah, you know, yeah, pushing just score like, right. If, right. So it feels more like race the world first, where like instead yeah. of like getting getting the first bosses down, you just have like an entire week of teams trying to complete the highest keys and the fastest keys i don't think that's something that would translate well to a blizzard organized thing but it's an excellent Probably, community yeah. in fact i think it's better like i think like for example if you look at the vibe of co-streaming versus like casting mdi that the vibe of co-streaming would be the only real suitable solution i think for what you're suggesting which is, sounds like what dratnos and tettles have already done like that's that sounds smart and interesting and if you like mythic plus and it's like actually a week that's perfect you know, and you know a ton of people are going to be playing and you're commentating over it and they're all playing at the same time. That That is just super interesting. Like you're seeing really high keys going back to back. I like that idea a lot. I, I have an idea kind of for the raid thing. I think, I don't know if I talked about this on this podcast before, um, but it would be a way to like do some kind of raid esporty thing. Like obviously the race world first is this massive, massive thing in WoW, but it's like community run and just it's all around new stuff. I'm thinking like an MDI style thing, but just for a rating. The idea would be, uh, let's say it's some weekend, just like the MDI is a weekend. You know, any any team can sign up if they want to do this. They have some kind of cash prizing. The whole thing is streamed. But the idea is they just release one boss over the weekend. Uh, the difficulty level is probably less than Tendril, higher than Smolderon. That's a pretty massive uh Yeah, gap, that's most bosses, but, like, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think somewhere in that realm, either on the easier or the hard side, probably easier to start out because uh, you would want more people to feel like they can participate in this. Like, for example, if you made like a tendril, I mean, how many t it would just you would it would be I mean, maybe this thing ends up just boiling down to people watching Echo and Liquid anyway. But like that would definitely be that. And it would like I think it'd be really cool to include a lot more people. There's a lot of people who would maybe love to compete, but they can't because they don't have the resources and stuff. This eliminates splits, helpers, you know, all that external stuff, gone, right? All you need to do is show up for like a day or two or something. I don't know how long it would take. There's no dungeon journal. Uh, most of the load or the lift from a uh, developer's standpoint is actually usually art. I think this could be less invested in the art space because this is maybe something that this boss isn't going to be released on live at any point. Uh, that's also another hurdle to cross, but, you know, it doesn't take them that long to come up with, like, cool, interesting mechanics that work together. It's more like, how do you make it look insane to be worth this, you know, super historic game? It's not that, right? It's a tournament, it's a thing you're logging on. You don't have to worry about gearing your character. Log on, tournament realm, get as geared of a character, you can play as many characters as you want. You don't have to make 12 characters to compete in the race like you do on live. And all you do is you just, again, no dungeon journal, you're going in, figuring out the name of the boss and all the mechanics at once. The idea is this runs for, like, one to two days. If this was streamed, I think this would get hundreds of thousands of viewers the entire time, right? I think it would get the race world first audience. You could do it in between, uh, you know, like an actual race. And it's like a way to like have, so like obviously selfishly for me, this would be super fun. This would be something to prepare for and get better and compete in like halfway in between these races coming out. And it would also show off the really really good guilds that do not raid for race to world first and you'd see and also those guilds would get a very rare opportunity if they would want to do this and i think this would be smart to problem solve on their own they're not in a scenario where we've already raided much more than them they log on and the only feasible solution is to come up with maybe a slight variation of something we've already done you approach it with let's just see how we do when we just try to figure this thing out it's not only infinitely more fun but it also builds the skill set to actually do this because you're usually deprived of that in a lot of ways so that would be my idea i think kind of impractical i don't think they would ever do this just because it's kind of hard to make raid bosses but if you talk about the viewership they get back on this i think it would be unbelievably huge yeah i yeah, that, that i really agree cool. 
that would be sick. I, I agree with you that it's like creating a boss just for TR, I think is the big hurdle of like how right, intensive is that? Is, that. is that something they would ever do without having already been shown how big it would be? Because I, I think if they knew it would be as big as we think it would be, they would do it. But I don't think that they would have enough confidence in that without trying it. And I don't think they would try it without like, yeah. yeah yeah which is sad um but it would be so sick i think that'd be awesome i wonder if there's anything you could do with just like live raid like i wonder if there's any competitive thing you could do at like this time in a raid cycle with a mirdrasil in some kind of competitive setting like i wonder if you could mm -hmm. just take you know a mythic raid boss and and give guilds an hour and be like okay whoever kills this in the fastest time, like the fastest combat time, you know, wins or something like that, right? And then you do like a speed kill competition on them or something. Like, I wonder if that would have any Ooh. interest or if that's just like, because like, to some extent, that's a lot less exciting to watch, but it is a lot closer to what guilds do during farm on a weekly basis. Whereas the competition you've suggested is very similar to what you and Echo and Method do and what basically nobody else does, which is blind progging a boss, right? And like, strategizing and coming up with the things new rather than like tuning and perfecting so i wonder if that would be like i wonder if you zoned a bunch of people in and it's like okay we've got 16 guilds like they're all going to try and do smolder on now who can get it who can kill it fastest right and then like okay now we're going to fire act right like who's going to kill this one who, who can do a fastest fire act kill what strats are they going to use here like because what about to some extent we haven't optimized that right like optimizing a fire act in full gear there's a little bit of that that people do during farm, but the reality is you don't have to do that to kill the boss. There's there's, there's nothing no that to. actually requires you to do that. So there would be some innovation there, right? Like how many healers can you shave down to, right? Like where are you going to lust? Where are you going to put your pots and stuff? But would that be an interesting to watch? Would anybody care to watch that? Maybe not. Well, there's some examples of that. So th there was a speed run race thing that someone sponsored. It was in Shadowlands. I want to say it was during Castle Nathria. I remember this. Yeah, yeah. Castle Nathria. That was sick. Yeah, and I like, ended up figuring out about it like at the last second and I co-streamed it. We were not competing. Echo was not competing, but Pieces was. And there was a few other guilds uh, that were competing that were pretty good. And it was actually really, really fun to watch them do that. And it got really good viewership um, and it kind of just fizzled out and no one ever did anything since then. And I can only imagine if there was enough incentive to like have us or Echo in that people would, the viewership would be very high. Uh, but also there's always been like, a weird thing about like like the race is just so big that really putting any effort into like getting convincing our players to really care about something like this is really hard like even a lot of the charity stuff has always been weird because it's like you know you want to do it for charity but you know echo really tries hard all this stuff and we're like Dude, we don't, it's like a charity thing we don't really try hard but then we're gonna like lose and then they care about that and then we don't like that they care about that and then it's like <laughs> it's like all of this is bad like yeah i don't like this at all uh you know so like it would kind of be like that uh, but if they got people to care about it and there's some kind of incentive, that would be cool. Something I had an idea of is like kind of like a randomizer. Like, mm. I don't know, give give Blizzard devs like this is not just a tournament realm thing. This is like late in the patch. You know, I don't know. There's like a month left in the season. The people who are still playing in the season, good on you. You know, um, there's like maybe an increased progression path or something to like juice up your gear a little bit. Could be mog related. I don't know. But they kind of just like take the thing that I think makes this not practical is it's going to take dev time to do this. Throw some mechanics around from different bosses. Just toss them into other bosses and swap some stuff around. Not fully losing the identity of any boss, but you know maybe one or two things. And it's like, oh, how would you actually deal with Smolderon orbs on Tendril, for example? Or like, how would you deal with roots going out on Laridar? Like, uh, you know, like your whole raid's getting rooted and you have to break. Like, like I don't know, just stuff like that, I think would be interesting. I think people, at least if it wasn't too far removed from the race, at least in my mind, they would have, like, people would, would, would watch that too. And it would at least be less load than creating something new, but mixing around things that already exist. Might be a little bit of a clown fiesta too. I don't know, because then they'd have to test it, you know? Then people complain. Can imagine Twitch chat, you know? Like, oh, they can't even release this stuff. It's like, dude, it's like, they're like doing a randomizer on WoW bosses, you know? But, I don't know, just something like that. I, I think there's yeah. room for it. Doesn't seem like any of it would ever happen, but man, I would. I don't know if you guys agree. I I really think. Forget about other guilds. Like I think it's cool about other guilds. If 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 Echo and Liquid are going head to head on a really hard boss ever, I think that would, especially if it seemed like it could it, it could end at any moment. Right, you're basically skipping ahead to the end of the race. There's just no way that more than a hundred thousand people are not watching that until it ends. Um, 
and Blizzard, again, it probably is not going to agree with that until they see it, but I, I'm almost certain that would exist. Yeah, personally, I don't really find the whole uh, speed running raid races to be that exciting. Like, I don't I, know if some of you guys might be interested in, but I, I don't I don't feel like it's as interesting as like watching guilds beat a really hard boss for the first time. Like I think that's so much cooler than just like, all right, kill this boss as quick as you can. I I feel like an idea. So do you guys ever watch any like Dark Souls or Elden Ring or Sekiro modded boss fights? Yeah. I was thinking like, what if they had something like that? Like you just have like, say Smolderon, but Smolderon on crack and it's just like a tournament version of it where you're, people try to figure out how to beat this boss. That'd be kind of cool. Like, what if you just had Smolderon and when it's doing World in Flame, mm. the circles will just slowly suck you in. Or, like, you know, they have, like, extra mechanics on top of whatever the mechanics. That way, it's not too far off from what it is on live. Yeah, I mean, like, if you're... If, you're, what the fight is, if like you go back to my original idea, right? Like, if you're... The most impractical thing is, hey, they're going to make this new boss. It's a lot more realistic to say, like, hey, there's going to be a little MDI-ish kind of weekend for raid guilds. Uh, later in the season and you guys are going to have to fight Giga Smolderon and you'll have to fight like you know and, and they'll make it really really hard right like you, there's there's every it's so funny people call bosses easy but they could add like just one or two things and that boss just becomes impossibly difficult uh you know they just add Holandra's bombs to Smolderon right just just as a potentially like you could you could I mean I guess you could add Holandra's bombs to anything and it would be really hard but uh yeah that I, I think that is a more realistic version of what I was suggesting. And you don't know. Like, you know you're fighting Giga Smolderon, but this isn't PTR tested. There isn't a dungeon journal. You don't know what Giga Smolderon means until you log in, and then they can go as wild as they want with it. All right. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, I think there's... Um, I don't, I'm sure there's a lot more as well that could be done with WoW Esports. I think Esports on the side of, like, even just like the gearing up your character and, you know, progressing it that way. We've seen that be kind of really connecting with people with hardcore, that like hardcore classic wow. But oh, I think for true, a while... The 1v1 tournament. Yeah, now was tournament. trying a like uh, hardcore Keystone Master challenge on a character or something like that, which was cool as well. Um, so I think there's room for like innovation beyond just dungeons and raids as well. But I don't know. I think dungeons and raids are so sweet. I think there is a lot more potential in there for more stuff that is just dungeons and raids yeah but uh i think we've we've covered these topics pretty well how do we feel about moving yeah. on to the uh the old patreon question yeah let's do it all right let's check it all right this week's one comes from gonzo that says there are a decent number of players that like the idea of a support class that's doing more than just healing but augmentation evoker really oh, didn't hit me. the mark when i think of good supports i think about the support and jungle rules in league of legends they don't necessarily heal or improve damage. They have stops, slows, and other abilities that enable their team to take advantage. But translating that to WoW seems tricky. I could imagine a spec that's just overflowing with stops and kicks, but that would either be severely overpowered or underpowered depending on tuning. Current implementation aside, is there room in WoW for a support role? If so, what would be a better way to do it? I mean, I think I exactly that. That's actually what I enjoy a lot about tanking. And also, I completely agree with, like, the whole having a support class that does more than just healing. I, like, don't really like the healing aspect of WoW, but I, I love the support part of playing, like, a healer, for example. Like, just, just something that does all the jobs, you know, something that, like, does all the CCing. Like, you could be, like, a support rogue, something that, like, deals with the mechanics, hits the explosives. I think that'd be cool. Yeah, it's really hard, though, like, how do you make a class that does I don't think you can useful supportive things like stops and interrupts and have that work in raid M plus and PvP equally well? Because like when you think about those sort of supportive effects, they are just so different value from those different parts of the game, right? Like it just doesn't do anything yeah. in raid, right? Like think about the Vengeance Demon Hunter utility suite. That is just overpowering an M plus right now. And completely in irrelevant in Raid. In Raid, it's worse than Gorfian's Grasp just by itself from Blood Decay, right? Well, like, but what about something like a BM Hunter that does, like, you know, a lot of the jobs in Raid? Like, maybe yeah. that doesn't happen as much nowadays, but it, it was, like, a thing here and there, right? And Og does sometimes get to be the job doer a little bit in Raids, but <laughs> the fact they're just short-range kind of stops them from being yeah, a... mechanic uh, doers. A mechanic doer. But, like, the reason that 
classes like BM and Moonkin have been mechanic doers is that they've been long range and tanky, uh, like at times that let them do that, right? Like, or like completely mobile, able to do their damage while moving. Um, none of that's about like having a support ability or anything like that, right? Like it's just you pick somebody to do it and they do the job because it's really hard to design a boss mechanic that requires you to use an ability rather than just like moving places, right? I don't, I don't think. Yeah, I don't know if it makes sense in well. Like the whole, like the whole, like oh, maybe there's just a class that's like super, super sick at stops, and so, like that's kind of odd. Like that's what odd. That's yeah. That's you got eruption. You got you got evoker racial, right? You got a uh, you got uh, the other evoker racial. Uh, I think support specs in WoW are really weird because the only real support spec we've seen is basically just a DPS spec that just has way more value than every other DPS spec. It, it is just a DPS spec that is impossible to track on logs and also just has more stops and utility than anyone. So it's just been a weird addition for sure. Like you say, you're not a fan of AUG. I think a lot of people aren't. Uh, but I think so the support roles in this game have always existed. It's healers and tanks in a different kind of way, right? Uh, and I, I think maybe having them have some more cool things, like let's just say like in a dungeon, the stops and kicks and or kicks are managed more by tanks and healers. I don't know if healers and tanks would really dislike that. I know that healers have really appreciated having kicks this expansion, right? Like maybe there's some room to make those roles a little bit more broad uh, than like making a support class. I think just making, I think making a support class, and I don't know if they've like moved back from this. I know they've like put some hero talents in and stuff, but I think Aug has kind of shown like there, there can't be more of that. You know, it's just... And because in reality, it would just be such an issue that they're going to have to dumb it down to the point where it's just like a weird DPS spec that just has some more stuff. And then it's just going to be another DPS spec. I think this game has always worked really well with healers, tanks and DPS, in my opinion. All right. Cool idea, yeah, I mean, I, I understand the desire for playing support. And I, I know there's people who like playing AUG because they like feeling like a support. But, you know, it is basically just a DPS spec with the... Some duct tape over it, some camouflage. Yeah. Um, and then just a bunch of extra stuff. I think the best solution to making a tank or healer more of a support is by just reducing the amount of healing and tanking required. But uh, yeah, obviously that that makes the other end of the spectrum bad, right? Like for the people who only care about healing and for the tanks who only care about tanking stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's always the tension, right? Like, healers that want to DPS, that don't want to DPS under any circumstances, and tanks that want their damage to matter versus don't want their damage to matter, tanks that want to need healing that versus tanks that don't want to need healing, which is most high-end tanks, tanks that, you know, appreciate the skill expression of holding threat versus tanks that hate losing threat, which is also most tanks, because most of the time it's not really skill-based, it's just <laughs> the specs you're playing with. Um yeah, I, I, I think to clarify my answer, I think Blizzard's effort into support could, all of that effort could be put into just making healing and tanking in this game exactly what it should be and like find the right spot for that. Like there's a lot of conversation right now about, especially with the prevalence of defensives in this expansion, the whole like cooldown meta, like you just need a cooldown for this. And if you don't, it's just like, you can't really do anything. The game just didn't used to be like that. Like there's like healing is not in its best spot. I think healing really needs to be looked at. I think every bit of effort that could be put into making a support role should just be put into making healing feel really, really good and tanking feel really, really good. There there's been time. Yeah. It's totally depends. You totally hit the nail on the head with this. Um, but like tanking, people will tell you about times where tanking is like way more fun. Higher level players have more agency. Not everyone wants that. Some healers like spamming tanks. I think that's pretty uninteresting. I think there's always a more interesting way of having healing happen than just spamming casts on your tank, but, like, some people like that. But, like, finding a nice balance and having tanking and healing feel really good, which both those roles are always uh, lacking on players compared to DPS, for sure. Uh, I, I, I just wish they would focus more on that instead. All right, I think that's going to be it for this episode of The Potty C. We will be back next week with something. So that's the plan, at least. With something. There will yeah. be something. Mm, something. Oh. Yep. That's the plan. Stay tuned. Stay tuned.
Yes. Bye. Yo. Yeah.